Good morning and welcome. My name is Tony Penny and I have the tremendous honor of serving as the Chief Learning Officer here at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Today is about you, the students, your questions and your concerns you might have about education. But before we get to you, I want to take just a moment to recognize the work of my colleagues in the Annenberg Presidential Learning Center who work so hard to invest such long hours and visit schools and dedicate themselves to supporting students year-round, but especially on days like this. So, if you don't mind, please join me in giving a hand to Jamie Lee, Becky, Jeff, Whitney, and Rebecca from our Annenberg President. <laughs> so as you saw in the video, our education mission here at the foundation is to do all within our power to cultivate the next generation of citizens and leaders. Each year we work with more than 40,000 students through our various programs and last year we awarded more than one and a quarter million dollars in scholarships uh, to students both here in Ventura County and from across the country. So why do we do this? Why is our work in education so critical here at the foundation? Well, in a 1988 radio address to the nation on education, President Reagan said, since the founding of this nation, education and democracy have gone hand in hand. Thomas Jefferson not only wrote the Declaration of Independence and served as our third president, but also founded one of our most distinguished institutions of higher learning, the University of Virginia. Jefferson and the founders believed that a nation that governs itself, like ours, must rely upon an informed and engaged electorate. So for us, education isn't just something nice that we do in addition to everything else that happens here at the foundation and in the museum. It's essential, and it's essential not just to the foundation, but it's essential to our community, and it's essential to our country. Much of the discussion around the broader purpose of education for quite some time now has been around two C's that you're probably well familiar with, college and career. But long before you head off to college and long after you end your career, there's another C that education can and should prepare you for, and that is perhaps your most important role, and that is the role of citizen. Today, you'll get a chance to play that role. So 2018 marks the 35th anniversary of a report that was issued during the Ronald Reagan administration called A Nation at Risk. Later this year, we'll be hosting the Reagan Institute Summit on Education. You take the first letter of each of those words. It spells RISE. Uh, so RISE 2018 in Washington, DC. It'll be a national conversation about the purpose of education in America. We're excited about it. We've confirmed five former secretaries of education as well as a host of other education luminaries and hope that some of you will be able to join us in April for that convening. But the conversation about education won't start or end there. It's been happening since the very beginning of our country and it's happening here today. When the report was published, President Reagan said that education was not simply another part of American society. It was the key that opened the golden door. And that's what we aim to do here today. We want to work with students to help open the doors of opportunity that exist for each and every citizen. So whether you're going to be or are currently a doctor, a plumber, a lawyer, a programmer, a teacher, a superintendent, a school board trustee, a community college chancellor, a state senator, you are also and will always be a citizen. You are part of we the people. You are part of e pluribus unum and you are part of the United States of America. And guess what? Citizens who are part of these things are powerful. You have a say, you have a voice, you have a vote. That's power. And what do we learn from the great ancient wisdom of Spider-Man about power? Any Spider-Man fans? Maybe, okay. Well, Spider-Man teaches us that with great power comes great responsibility. So today, you're gonna see what it looks like to exercise that power to embrace that responsibility, to flex those citizen muscles, and to see firsthand what it looks like when education and democracy stand hand in hand. So with that, today's about you, the students, and we will turn it over to the students. So allow me to introduce your host for today, the delightful, the talented, from the Simi Valley Youth Council, Ms. Jocelyn Preet Pender. Good morning, everyone. I welcome you all to the fourth annual Youth Town Hall, hosted by the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute and the Simi Valley Youth Council. My name is Jason Prepander, and I'm currently a senior at Santa Susana High School, as well as a member of the Simi Valley Youth Council. 
At this time, I ask that everyone please stand and join my fellow Youth Council members in honoring our troops and veterans with the Pledge of Allegiance. Right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Now, we are all gathered here today to discuss the topic of education. And I ask that you, the audience, take an active role with us today to help shape the future of our students. Now, all of you will have the opportunity to ask our panelists any questions you have regarding the topic matter. At any point, if you would like to do so, we ask that you direct your questions and comments to Twitter using the hashtag SYTH2018 or texting SYTH2018 followed by your question to 22333. Additionally, you will have the option of writing your question on a question card and then handing them to one of our lovely student engagement team members. Now, before I announce our honored panel, I would like to recognize our special guest in the audience. Chief Administrative Officer of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute, Joanne Drake. Ventura County Community College District Trustee representing Area 4, Bernardo Perez. <laughs> Simi Valley Unified School District Board Member, Bob LaBelle, Clerk of the Board. <laughs> Simi Valley Unified School District Board Member, Bill Daniels. City of Simi Valley City Manager, Eric Levitt. <laughs> Simi Valley Unified School District Director of Secondary Education, Dr. Deborah Salgado. <laughs> Simi Valley Unified School District Director of Elementary Education, Kathleen Roth. City of Simi Valley Community Service Director, Selmer Bar Barwick. <laughs> and our wonderful Youth Council Coordinator, Kristen Tignack. <laughs> and now, please welcome our moderators for today, Youth Council members Hamna Ahmad, a junior from Royal High School. and Anushka Vakil, a senior from Santa Susana High School. Please give a warm welcome for our four panelists as I introduce them. California State Senator Scott Wilk. State Senator Wilk currently represents the 21st Senate District after spending four years representing the 38th Assembly District. He serves as the Vice Chair of the Senate Committees on Education and Agriculture and is a member of Committees on Budget, Business, Professions and Economic Development, and Veteran Affairs. He also currently works closely with Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority funding and concentrates on growing California's economy. Next, we have Ventura County Community College District Chancellor, Dr. Greg Gillespie. Dr. Gillespie has worked in the community college system for more than 24 years as a faculty member, director, dean, vice president, or president in states such as Arizona, California, and Washington. Through his current position and the number of local, state, and national organizations he is part of, Dr. Greg Gillespie focuses on providing student-centered access to informative and quality education programs. Next, we have Simi Valley Unified School District trustee, Don Smolin. Trustee Smolin was appointed to the Simi Valley Unified School District Board of Trustees in July 2017 and has served on a number of PTA and PTSA committees and the Simi Valley Education Foundation. She has spent the last 10 years at council level and served as chair of every 15 minutes as well as Junior Olympics. 
And lastly, we have Simi Valley Unified School District Superintendent, Dr. Jason Poplinski. <laughs> Dr. Poplinski became the district superintendent in October of 2014. Prior to that, Dr. Poplinski has worked at Quartz High School, Park High School, Royal High School, Abraham Lincoln School, and Santa Susana High School as a teacher, assistant principal, and principal. Now, we are extremely honored to have our four esteemed panelists with us today to share their experience and knowledge on education, a widely expanding matter that is shaping the lives of today's youth and tomorrow's world leaders, innovators, and scientists. It is what allows us to chase our dreams and become that future doctor or that future engineer, future teacher, or even future president. Education is something that has been very, very crucial to our lives, and it always will be. With that, I hope you take advantage of this opportunity to initiate change and voice your opinions to such influential leaders in our community. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the fourth annual Youth Town Hall. Thank you for all being here and being an active part of our discussion today. To start off our discussion, our first topic will be on life in the classroom. Our first question is directed to Senator Wilk. Most students graduate high school without the knowledge of how to pay taxes, how to pay a mortgage, and several other things that are needed in becoming an adult. Are there any plans of implementing these skills into the high school curriculum? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's interesting because when I was in high school, your sophomore year, you did a semester of health, and then a semester, I don't remember what they call, but you learned how to do a checkbook, savings account, all, all, those, all those life skills. And uh, it's, it's, it's out of the curriculum now. Uh, last year, we did push, uh, we pushed a bill that's going to start embedding those life skills into other areas of, of education, so you'll learn some of them. I have been, uh, along with Matt DeBobney from the San Fernando Valley, pushing to actually have that class. I think there's too much focus at the K-12 level of everybody going to college. And that's, and, and that's great. Some people need to want to do career tech. And you also need to have those life skills. I know for me, I had to teach both my kids you know, how to do My My daughter just thought if you had a credit card, that was, you were good to go. Um, and so those are important skills. Uh, we we are, are taking steps to, to improve that, but I personally think we need more. We need to have a dedicated class. Thank you for your response. Uh, so what was, uh, for um, Senator Woke, what was one of the reasons that these um, vocational education programs, why were they phased out earlier, and um, what is kind of the push to bring them back? Yeah. So I, was, I wasn't there when, when they eliminated, but, but career tech is, is incredibly, incredibly important. So when I was young, it was, you know, auto shop, wood shop, stuff like that. But now, now, now it's everything. So okay, I used to be on the College of Canyons Board of Trustees prior to getting elected, uh, elected to the State Assembly. And we very active in career tech. And we had started a program, metal, a medical technician program. Uh, there was prerequisites, and then when you, it was a two-year program, and even when you graduated, you didn't have an AA, but you had a certificate. So our, our initial cohort, 16 students, two of those students, by the way, had uh, BAs in biology from UC Santa Barbara, but couldn't get employed because they didn't have the technical, they had the intellectual skills, but not, but not the technical, you know, applications of it. So that, that, first, that first cohort, core, ho, cohort, they graduate, all 16 got job offers right there in Santa Clarita, making 65000 a year and up to, to start. So we, we need to do more, more of that as the, the challenge we have in, in the world today is that we have the internet revolution, we have globalization, and, and we're at the point now where every student in the world competes against one another. So we need to be doing these, uh, these programs for two reasons. One, so America remains com economically competitive. And number two, we have a moral obligation to, uh, to empower you to, to pursue your dreams and be able to compete with every other student in the world, well, worker in the world. All right, moving on to our next question for Superintendent Poplinski. 93% of high school students in Finland graduate, whereas in California, only 75.5% graduate. 
Have you thought of adjusting our education programs to others such as Finland or other countries who have higher success rates? So interestingly enough, part of my doctoral studies were done in Finland. Um, so I'd like to impart a little um, um, information about the system there. Um, they educate about 550,000 students in the entire country, which is about half the size of LA Unified alone. So it's a very different um, perspective. Students don't start school till they're seven. They've come to school already learned um, how to read. Uh, parent expectation that students arrive to school with lead, reading um, foundation skills. Uh, the thing that's also very different about Finnish schools is that special education students, students who don't speak Finnish and Swedish, um, don't attend their schools. They have, um, they're called welcome schools, which is ironic, but um, you go to these schools to become proficient in a language um, prior to going into any content-based class. So very different than American schools. Public education in the United States accepts all students, as I feel it should be, and that includes special education students, students that are learning um, languages from other countries. So it's really not a comparable system. What I tell our teachers all the time, though, is there are some foundations about the Finnish system, which I do really like and gravitate towards. Um, they revolve around the way we test, um, homework, those kind of things, which teachers can absolutely create in their classroom. So although it would be very difficult for our country to replicate that system on a national or even state or city level, teachers can certainly do it within their classrooms. Thank you. Um, so speaking on these changes in education, um, one thing that we've seen in the classroom is the introduction of technology such as Khan Academy, um, Google Classrooms. So do, uh, do you believe that eventually those platforms will be used to um, replace uh, education in the classroom or are they being used, would they be used more as a supplement to the education that we have currently? Yeah, so I, I don't think that, um, that we will ever completely replace um, the teacher, nor should we. And I believe that the mixture, um, these hybrid courses that have some online component as well as a face-to-face -face component with, with teachers, which is happening more and more at the higher ed level. I teach in a doctoral program, and um, I've taught both ways. I've taught um, completely online, which I don't like, and I've um, taught you know face-to-face -face completely 100%. And I also know that for many people that are looking for advancement in degrees, they're working full-time jobs, so some kind of hybrid model um, is really useful to them. Um, I certainly believe in introducing technology where feasible, and um, in our district, we have many, many of our teachers that have found creative ways to use technology to help communicate with students, to help to disseminate information, particularly helpful when students like yourselves have busy schedules, they're away from school today, um, potentially Teachers have the ability to post you know, lessons and those kind of things uh, through social media, and, and I certainly support that. But as I said, I think the value um, of the richness of conversation that comes face-to-face -face with a teacher um, at whatever level um, can't be replaced by technology. Thank you. Next, let's go over to our social media table for a question from the audience. Uh, we have a question from the audience. An audience member would like to direct this question to Dr. Poplinski. How are you teaching students to make themselves valuable in a society that is becoming increasingly dependent on technology, technology and automation? Yeah, that's a nice segue. Um, I, I, well, see, here's the thing about um, my educational experience. Um, I, I think that education for all of us is afforded to us, and it's what we make of it. Um, I do believe that the state has done a lot in recent years to um, help public education, K-12, to help students to develop some of those marketable skills that they'll need in life um, and in career or in, in higher ed. So in terms of um, the new state standards that went into effect a few years ago, they do lend themselves to more cooperation and collaboration um, in the learning process, which obviously lends itself to the workforce or higher ed as well. Um, so I do believe that the state has made great strides to reintroduce some of those um, practices that went away, um, and the introduction of new monies back into vocational education, which is very different from the vocational education of um, when I was in high school. This is a very clear distinction that I think we need to make. Vocational education of today is um, college and career ready. It's not one or the other. 
And when I was in high school, if you were on a vocational diploma track, that you, were, you did not have the option to go to um, a four-year school. And my goal, as I've said all along, um, when we graduate seniors, is that I want um, their destination to be a genuine choice and that their circumstances don't dictate what options they have. So if they choose junior college, the military, work, or four-year school, um, that that was a genuine choice and that their circumstances um, allowed them to choose any of those four. So I, um, I would say that we're on the road with that. Um, but again, education is what we all make of it. And I believe that um, wholeheartedly that it's, a, it's an enormous thing that we should not take for granted in our country that everyone is afforded a system that is free. And um, you know, it's, it's what students put into it, which they will get out of it, like most things in life. Um, so speaking on some of the issues that we address in classrooms, uh, Trustee Smolin, how do you believe controversial issues should be addressed in the classroom, and do teachers have a responsibility to address these issues, or does the risk of political bias outweigh the benefit of teaching them? Wow, okay, so um, <clears throat> here's, the, here, here's the thing. I don't think that it is... Um, it is, I'm sorry, I'm so like a little nervous. <laughs> You're a big crowd. Um, first off, Ed Code says that teachers, if they are going to bring um, anything political into a classroom, have to show both sides, right? So they can't show, they can't show a bias one way or the other. And it's, it's good for conversation, and it's certainly valuable, especially in a lot of... Um, history classes and other, and other classes of that sort, um, being socially aware of, current, of things that are going on and having um, a good, healthy discussion on those matters. But you really need to have a, a balanced discussion. You know, otherwise, you, know, you, can't, you can't campaign in a classroom. So they're not allowed to, to discuss ballot measures or candidates or anything like that, not showing one. I'm so tongue-tied. Mm -hmm. How am I doing? You did well. OK. You're doing great. Um, they really need to be able to show both sides. So unless they're going to present it in that way, um, I don't think that it should be presented in a classroom. I, it, it goes against ed code. But um, I think there's a definite value in discussing those things that are important to students. See, I'm relaxing, it's better. Um, there is a definite value in, in discussing those things that are important to students, important to their community, and um, to society as a whole, so that they have a, a better, a much more well-rounded view of what is going on. May I jump on that one as well? Please. Um, I think uh, what's interesting about uh, the time we live in is what used to be considered controversial 20 years ago is now commonplace in discussion and in curriculum. So as we evolve um, and as issues and topics evolve and as, the, as the, um, the curriculum does change, what used to be considered is now, um, now a requirement to be taught. And so as, as you enter into the teaching profession and depending on you know, when you started, uh, what would have been considered something that was taboo and not to be talked about may now actually be part of the law that you must teach. So I think it's interesting is, is that it's constantly evolving and as, um, as the country evolves as well on certain issues, they become more commonplace. Um, whereas if you're um, from an, a, a different you know, um, perspective or when you were in school, that may have been a topic that was not to be discussed and now it's part of the law to be discussed. Thank you. All right, let's go to our social media table again for another audience question. So we have received yet another question from the audience. An audience member would like to address Trustee Smolin <coughs> on this question. Great. High school level classes taken in middle school do not receive questions. Why is this? Is there any, anything against this in the California Education Code? Um, I actually don't know the answer to that question. What I do know is that in, if you're taking, let's just say, algebra in a middle school classroom, and then you go to high school, you're preparing yourself to take upper level division classes and graduating um, with those classes under your belt. So in a way, you're benefiting, not necessarily with credit, but with the 
availability to advance to those higher classes as you reach high school. And the issue really is not that they don't receive credit, it's that every district has a set of graduation requirements. So if you're given credit for math courses in middle school, it doesn't necessarily remove the requirement that you must do three right. more years of math. So it's not necessarily the particular course, but the number of courses that are required by each district. And they can be different across the state. The state does have a minimum graduation requirement, but I guarantee you that everybody in here attends a school where the graduation requirements are higher than the state minimum. Uh, so Dr. Greg Gillespie, um, kind of going on that uh, issue of credits received um, you know, in middle school to high school. So specifically at a high school level, many students have the opportunity to go dual enrollment or take college classes at, um, uh, at a community college. Uh, so do you support students who want to maybe get ahead and get their college credits? Or do you believe it might detriment their education by exposing them to um, material that they might not have the necessary foundation for? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And uh, would also um, just like to thank all of you for being here this morning. It's great to see such a a big turnout for today's event. And you know, I've never had the opportunity to be here before, but I'm just really impressed with all the organization that's gone into the event and also the fact that we can bring a large number of, of students together to have these kind of conversations. But let's give our organizers and student organizers to another round of applause. <laughs> um, and um, you know, I really support um, high school students being able to obtain college credit while in high school because that really helps to um, speed their progression through higher education and ultimately towards whatever career goal they have. It also provides the opportunity for, for exploration at, at, a, at, at a lower cost type of a factor. Now, for any parents that are in here, you'd like that, but let's take maybe a free class, college credit class in high school, do that sum of exploration rather than paying um, higher college tuition for that. You know, our goal now that the legislature has really helped to pass dual enrollment legislation to allow both colleges and high school districts collect some reimbursement for students taking um, college level classes in the high school it really opens the door up for more of that to occur. And, and our goal at the community college district is to work with our high school districts to provide the opportunity for high school students to obtain between 15 and 30 college credits while still in high school. And that would be a combination of dual enrollment, which is where they're receiving the college and high school credit at the same time, concurrent enrollment, where we're there offering our college classes at the high school, as well as students coming um, to our campuses. Thank you. Moving on to our next question for Superintendent Poplimsky. How can we encourage students to have a meaningful discussion about the material they learn in class rather than memorizing facts and formulas? Well, that is um, you know, um, a good question. I think that there are certain things that will always have to be memorized. That is just a part of you know, what we do. Um, but I will say, um, from my undergrad experience, those of you who know me personally know that education wasn't my first path. Um, and I know um, Mrs. Roth down here and I both have medical school in our, in our history. And when we were in school, so much needed to be memorized that now is at their fingertips on a tablet. So um, we are evolving in that way. But I think education becomes real for you when you have a real life experience to associate that learning with the work. And um, that is currently where um, public education in California is headed. Uh, many of you in the room will be a part of a high school in our district that ha give you an opportunity to do some kind of internship at the end of a pathway. Uh, we currently have over 20 pathways functioning in our district that have some kind of real world uh, work application. And that's where those conversations become very meaningful. Um, and in terms of students, I go back to what I said before. Um, you know, so much of what you can get out of education really amounts to what you put into it as a student. <coughs> And um, you know, we say in our district, we, we make a joke of it all the time, but we have elect elected trustees. You have a huge cabinet of administrators, principals, assistant principals, and counselors, um, but we have also 17,000 educational experts in our district, and we rarely consult you. And so what we hope that um, comes 
about in um, you know, the years to come in our district is that students have a lot more say as to how and what they're learning and that you have some choice. And um, partnering with the community college district, some of you know already, we have college courses being offered on our campuses. Um, and I think that um, these kind of opportunities that uh, will continue to increase for students in our district, and it's really that real world application piece, having something to connect learning to that's going to affect you in real life that will um, you know, solidify learning. Thank you. Um, <coughs> so, <coughs> sorry. Um, so next we're gonna get a question from the social media table. We have a question from Ava, and she'd like to open it up to um, the panelists. So her question is, I'm not sure how graduate graduation requirements are determined, but I find they've kept me, and I'm sure a lot of students, from taking classes or electives they enjoy and may help them with their future careers. Is there any way to make graduation requirements more flexible? Well, they're constantly being looked at, but remember the aim too, just like when you go to college, there, usually there's some kind of university program is to produce well-rounded students. So um, we are currently in our district looking at um, removing the health requirement um, in our district for graduation. That is not a state requirement and replacing it with some kind of computer science elective as we know that's a growing field. So um, they are um, flexible, uh, they do evolve and um, it, obviously it takes more time um, than students sometimes would like, but I don't see um, the, the, the rounded nature of the um, electives or the requirements going away because part of what we aim to do as um, public institutions is to make students um, you know, um, effective citizens that have a well-rounded background of, of curriculum. Thank you. Next, let's look at a question asked from Flipgrid from a student from Royal High School. Hey, uh, my name is Davey, and the question I'm going to ask the panelists is, what improvements to the education system are you going to do in 2018? Yeah. 2018. Okay. <laughs> so this question, either panelist can answer. Could you repeat it again? What are we going to do to improve education? <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and um, give that a try, <laughs> yeah, because that is really broad and it's a really great um, question. You know, and, and I'll talk about this from a community college perspective in that community colleges are all about serving students. I mean, we recognize that, that that's our role. Um, I see community colleges being that nexus and the real connector between high schools and then further higher education to get bachelor's degrees and so on, as well as two careers. Community colleges serve that role of moving from high school to community college. You can take a career education course, move into a, a well-paying job that's in high demand, requiring high skills, or you can transfer. And because of our student success focus, there's a number of initiatives that we're always looking at to implement, and these often get supported through funding from the state legislature to help us do our job better. Just a couple of examples, we have a student success and support program that was, again, funded by the legislature a few years ago that now requires us to have all students take assessments so they can be correctly served by our colleges to develop an educational plan, and for us to have a broad range of support services to help them be successful. We have an equity program in place, and the goal of that is to close equity gaps so that it doesn't matter what your ethnicity <laughs> is, what your socioeconomic status is, what your age is, that demographic is not gonna be the measure of your success. Anybody who walks through our doors, no matter whether you're ready for college or not, you're going to be um, helped and you're going to be supported in achieving your educational goal. So we're making improvements every year to help that student experience be meaningful and of value so that a student moves up in the workplace or they move on to further 
higher education. I'll, I'll take a crack at it too, just a couple things quickly that I'm working on. First of all, we're going to be blessed that we're going to have a budget surplus again this year. And I think it, we won't know till the middle of May, but it's probably going to be even higher than, than what current projections are. So at the state level, we've talked about having a commitment to career tech education at the K-12 level. And we, we've been funding it recent years. And then last year, the governor cut it and cut it in half. Uh, so one of the things I'm working on is ensure funding for at least the next three years, because we're going to be getting a new governor uh, January of next year, because I, I think that's really important and the money's there to do that. Uh, something else I'm working on, uh, on the community college levels, right, right now uh, the colleges can only spend money on tutors for, for students doing remedial education. I want to I broaden that um, and allow the flexibility of colleges to, to spend it on any, any uh, subject matter uh, th that they want, because I think that's important that we try to, try to lift up everybody. So those are two things I'm working on this year. Thank you. Um, now we're going to go to our crowd for a question from student engagement. Hello. My name is Pranav Krishnamurthy. I'm with the student engagement team. I have a question from Lumbini Chandrasekhara from Santa Susana High School. And this question is directed to trustee Don Smolin and Dr. Poplinski. How can we be better in introduced to research opportunities in local institutions? Well, I think um, the, the pathways that we were mentioning um, are a, a great opportunity for that. And um, we have um, strategically placed different pathways across the valley at different schools so that um, it may be that something is offered in our district but not at your particular school. Um, and so um, I do think that we have uh, great connections with the Simi Valley Hospital if you're in the medical um, realm, if you're thinking about medicine as a career, we have a, a great pathway for you there. And I think we have an emerging um, connection with the tech industry. So those are opportunities that I think are more articulated in our district. And it may be that um, across the valley we see opportunity for students, but not at every single particular high school. And part of that is, um, you know, there are a lot of great classes that we would love to offer, but it really comes down to a student-driven schedule. So if only 12 students are signing up for a course like home economics or something like that, um, you know, that is not something that we're able to do. Um, but if you cluster uh, these kind of courses at a particular school in a particular pathway, you ultimately end up with enough students to be able to offer that. Um, and it does require sometimes students making choices about where they attend school. You go to Santa Susana High School, so you made a choice to go to a school that does not have athletics. So these are the kind of things that in order to pool resources, that many districts are having to do now. So to have a dedicated medical health pathway or a civics learning pathway at Royal High School or arts and technology at Santa Susana High School, the district has found that clustering those resources at one school and allowing students to make a choice about where they attend is the best use of those resources. Thank you very much. Can I just add, um, and, and it kind of goes further than that because there are certificated programs that, that those, those different pathways enable students to be to belong in and get certifications. I know the medical pathway at Simi High, if you, if you wanted to, you could get your CNA license before you even graduate high school. So that definitely puts you on a path to be successful or, or even just be able to explore something and find out if that's really the fit that you wanted or the thing that you were really interested in if it, it, when it came down to brass tacks, if that's really what you were fit for for yourself. And I know that those programs exist and with certifications, I think the hospitality, program at Royal, where you can have really real life experiences and there are coordinators at those schools that, to help you find them. Thank you so much. Okay, we have another question from our social media table. Um, we have received another question from the audience. An audience member would like to address Senator Wilk about this question. Will the repealing of net neutrality affect students and teachers in the classroom? That, that, so that, that's, actually, that's actually a federal issue that I have not really particularly delved into. So as you, as you may know, uh, probably a couple of years ago, the Obama administration tried to change the regulatory framework <coughs> for the net and treat it more like a utility. Uh, I would say prior to that, it was considered net neutrality, and we got along, we got along just fine. So that's something I'm going to continue to monitor, because one of the concerns that I have is the digital divide. 
Um, and so being able to have uh, students and just people of social, uh, lower socioeconomic uh, status to be able to have the same information uh, as, as any other citizen. So I don't really have a position on that because it's not in front of me. That's, that's a federal issue and we just need to continue to monitor it. I would say that up until two, two, two and a half years ago, we did have net neutrality and it seemed to work fine to me. Thank you. Um, moving on to our next topic, which is equity. We're going to start off with our first question to Senator Wilk. Compared to most other states, California has one of the highest shares of English language learners and students from low-income families, which indicates a high level of need. However, many believe that funding for California education will decrease due to the unpre unpredictable retirement costs from the baby boomer generation. Do you believe these retirement costs are a significant threat funding in California? And if they are, how do you plan to combat this deficit? Great. Great question. There's, so there's, actually, there's actually two parts to that. And so I'm going to talk about school funding first, and then we can talk about uh, public employee pensions. So three years ago, Governor Brown came out uh, with a new system that I ultimately supported. So in the past, we had what was called ADA, average daily attendance, and, and, the, and the dollars from Sacramento flowed with the student to, to wherever they went. Uh, what's going on in California is we're having immense demographic changes, and so in many respects, we're an incubator for, for the rest of America, because what's happening in California is going to happen eventually everywhere, so it's important that we get it right. So what the governor said is, look, at we have you know, many students that are you know, English second language. We have many foster youth uh, students with you know, in so, uh, lower socioeconomic status, and they most likely need more infrastructure and help. So how we do it now is we have base funding that goes with the student. And then if you, you know, foster youth, federal lunch program, uh, Eng English as a second language, there's additional funding that, that, that flows with that student to the, to the school. Uh, called the supplemental grant. And then if you're a particular school and, and you have 55% of your student population or over fits that category, then you get a concentration grant. So the whole point of that is to be able to provide the services for the students. Now, I believe in local control, and we, and we gave local control, but there's certainly been abuses of that. Uh, uh, LAUSD was uh, recently sued uh, for, for diverting that money and successfully sued. And so now we're looking in, in Sacramento, do we need to put parameters on it? I really don't want to do that. We have a local elected school boards, and, and, and they should be best positioned to, to do that. As it relates to public employee pensions, I get frustrated when the governor and everybody else in Sacramento says we have a balanced budget, because we don't. First off, every year the state auditor is required to do an audit of the state. So that means she adds up all of our assets, things we own, and, on, and all of our liabilities. So we are the sixth largest economy in the world, and our net worth as a state is negative $127.2 billion. <coughs> and that is debt that you're going to have to pay. And, and the reason for that, frankly, most of it is public employee uh, pensions and retirement health care costs, $236 billion off the book. So uh, we had, I'm on budget, we had a budget committee hearing just yesterday, and the governor was laying out his plan, and when we brought up uh, public employee pensions, they go, we have a plan. There's a written plan. The problem with the written plan, it's not reasonable. So in, in order for us to catch up, it's going to take us 30, 35 years, depending on, on which, uh, which retirement plan. They are expecting an annual return of 7%. Now, we had, everybody, I'm sure, had a great return you know, this year. But the year before, CalPERS got 1.5% return. That means that they now have to make that up in future years. So uh, two years ago, again, we had a budget surplus. We, we put in $4.5 billion additional into the teacher's retirement plan. Uh, this year, we're going to have at least a $7.5 billion surplus. Uh, I'm advocating rainy day fund, uh, buying, uh, paying down more of public employee pensions and, and, and some money set aside for infrastructure. That's certainly what the governor's uh, direction is as well. But I know for school districts, they're going to have, I think, beginning in 2019, real problems because when we put in that extra money, we reformed it where uh, employees have to put in more, local governments have to put in more, and then state, we have to put in a little more, but just a little <coughs> bit. And it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start impacting services. And, you know, in, from my view, we punted in 2014. 
um, and it's going to come up again. If it's not this year, it'll be, it'll be next year. And it, so the other question is, is some people want to change the retirement program midstream. Currently, we can't do that because it's called the California rule. Uh, but there's two lawsuits going through now, and depending on how the courts rule, there is a possibility <coughs> that we would have to uh, t take a look at that. I think that's a last resort, but depending on what happens in the economy, we, you know, we may have to do that. That's just a reality. Thank you. Next, we're going to answer a question from the crowd through student engagement. Hi there. My name's Nick Judge from the student engagement team. I have two questions that go hand in hand. The first one is for Senator Wilk. What is being done to address the student debt crisis? And the second one is for Dr. Gillespie from Perush from San Jose High School. What are your opinions on free community college and could it ever be achieved without full governmental support? I'll go first. Okay, um, in, in terms of s student debt, again, most of, that, most of that's a federal issue because they're the ones that they have greater jurisdiction over higher education, one, and number two, they're responsible for setting the parameters in, in terms of, of student loans. I know here at, at, the, at the state level, uh, a number of things. I know when I was on the community college board, I've done it since I've been in the legislature, trying to go to more open, open source material for students so you don't have to pay those outrageous prices for textbooks. Uh, I think the, the chancellor will tell you that oftentimes students' textbooks cost more than, than tuition. Uh, I also uh, was a co-author last year and we got it passed, uh, free, tuition first year for community college students and I know when you know in the master plan that was uh, what that was approved back when Jerry Brown's dad Pat Brown was governor uh, they 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 adopted in 1960 the master plan which called for free education you know across, across the board and and obviously in terms of community college I think about 60 percent of full-time students receive the the bog, the bog waivers uh, board of governors waivers and I think so we're doing a pretty good job there you know, the others have continued to climb. I was also co-author four years ago of the middle class scholarship for students going to CSU and, and, and UC, and the governor uh, cut, that, cut that last year because I know it's the middle class that always seems to get squeezed the most, and so I was kind of frustrated with that. So we're trying to do what we can to, to hold costs down as, as much as possible. Again, in, in fusions, I, I, when I first got there, because I got in, the, right when the Great Work Session was ending. Like historically, we, the UC system, we funded them about 50%. We were down to 25%. We're now up over the 50%. So I think you know, we're trying to, trying to do our part, but we, we need to do more. And, and I will add that, yes, I fully support um, you know, first year um, fee-free community, fee-free education for students to community colleges. In fact, I'd also actually like to have that expanded to have um, fee-free um, admittance and coverage at community colleges through completion. Um, really appreciate um, Senator Wilk and the legislature um, uh, passing the college, community college promise legislation. And now in the governor's budget, they're proposing, I think around 46 million to fund the program. And that would allow for students, if they're taking a full-time load, 15 units, and if we have a partnership with our area high schools, that they can come and not pay any fees. And that's really a great thing. And, and, and one of the reasons I support it is that, you know, for many students, high school is not gonna be the end point. I mean, part of education is we're wanting to create um, engaged citizens and we want to really help students get a meaningful career where they can support themselves, they can support their family. And at one time, a high school education did that. But really now, when you look at the economy, the skills needed today, you need at least a community college education. You can get a career ed degree and you can get a high wage, high demand job or you can transfer on. So really, I see it's our responsibility is, is when we look at helping to generate an educated public, prepare people for careers, let's fund them to the point that gets them there, which would be um, through community college. Thank, Thank you, you for your input. To move on to our next topic, which is health. Our first question is directed to Trustee Spolin. The average teenager gets about six to seven hours of sleep each night, though they need about eight to 10 hours to properly function. School times start as early as 8 a.m., whereas the human brain doesn't start to properly function until around 10 a.m. 
Has the school board considered changing the start time of school in hopes of better performance of students? Um, what I can tell you is I have not heard any discussion about changing the start time for school. I did do a little bit of research on it. <laughs> I, I saw that. Um, I did do a little bit of research on it, and I know that the Academy of Pediatrics in 2014 um, was talking about the adolescent body and, and the fact that um, you're not quite as awake in the morning as as a, ch a younger child or an older person. So there's, there's that um, developing body thing going on. But the other interesting things that I found were um, LA Unified did, also did a study, and um, test scores for math in particular, if they're taken in, er in the early morning, that test scores come back better and higher, um, whether it's the grade in the class or the grade on, on state testing. So not that I would be opposed to it starting later, but I would definitely be open to that discussion. But there are a lot of other things that go with that because you have, um, you know, obviously teachers um, and other staff that would have to be at the school later and earlier. And um, how are students going to be getting to school? A lot of the studies where that was done were done in places where a lot of their students arrived by bus, you know, and they have inclement weather. So they're those students are getting up at five in the morning to catch a bus by 6.30. To, so their, their wake time is a whole lot earlier than you know, your, our general wake time here. So I mean, I def, definitely think it's open to interpretation and I would be interested in getting uh, additional information and open to the discussion. Thank you. Did you want to add on to that? Well, I, well so the, <laughs> there, there was actually a bill in the legislature this year. I can't remember the bill number, but it was from Senator Portentino from, Pas, from Pasadena cleared the Senate, uh, got uh, mm -hmm. uh, held, yeah, held yeah. up in, in the State Assembly. He said he was gonna push it and he didn't. So they had a, a Stanford University professor come because he just did a new study showing that they would perform better. Um, my argument was we have local school boards, so if you have this study and you wanna share it, share with the local school boards and let them make the decision, not, not a one size fits all edict out of Sacramento, which happens far, far too often. Um, and I have one school district that actually changed uh, up in the Antelope Valley that changed later and they didn't find any, uh, any improvement, so they, they, they changed back. But the thing that was really funny about it is my whole point was local control, but I just made a funny comment about, you know, 20 years ago, we quit eating eggs because eggs were bad and now eggs are good. So that's great that you have this study, but I, we could hit five years from now, somebody could come out and say it's wrong. And then he went after me like I've never seen before and then I lost my cool, which I've never done before, and I went after him. And then I apologized to Senator Portentino. He said, no, he was inappropriate, don't worry about it. But what's funny, the next day, I got an apology email from the Stanford pr professor, and the reason he gave for being that way was that he didn't get enough sleep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Let's move on to our social media table for a question from the crowd. This is a question direct to Dr. Poplinski and Senator Scott Wilk, you're welcome to join in as well. Um, Rebecca Sternberg would like to ask, is there any plan to push for a more nutritional quality lunch program? Not only is the food lower quality, but it is very expensive for those who do not get free or reduced lunch. How can we fix this? Uh, I, this, was, this is something I would love to do. We used to um, have you know, cooking co kitchens and the reality is, is this is just an issue of cost. Um, when you prepare a, you know, a homemade meal from scratch, um, it's three to four times the cost from what we receive now. So um, it may seem expensive now to students who are not on free or reduced lunch, but um, we have done some research on this. There are districts um, in the state of California who have gone to a more home-cooked gourmet um, a menu, uh, and the cost is very high. Um, but also it seems to happen in, in smaller districts. You know, when you have 28 campuses, uh, it's a very difficult thing to accomplish because no longer do we have um, cooking kitchens on all of our campuses. Most of the food is cooked in centralized kitchens and then delivered to, um, to uh, school sites. Um, I still am a, a strong pro proponent of the school lunch program, um, but also know that many, many students now are taking advantage of preparing meals at home um, that may be more healthy or that they perceive to be more healthy. Um, but all of, uh, all of the meals that are delivered in public schools are actually under regulatory process. So um, believe it or not, it may not seem like it, but believe it or not, all of those meals um, are balanced with the cal caloric intake and 
um, sugars and all those kind of things. And um, it's, it may not seem like that to young people, um, but it is. And we've actually piloted in some of our schools recently salad bars and sandwich bars and those kind of things, hoping that they would become popular with students. And unfortunately, they just were not. Oh. So that, that's part of where the lunch program is now. Did you want no, to? I, I really can't add to that. I <laughs> thought that was an excellent answer. All right, perfect. Next, we'll look at a question asked from another student at Royal High School via Flipgrid. <laughs> my God. Hi, my name is Timothy, and the question that I have can be addressed by anyone and pertains to the topic of bullying. Now, I haven't seen bullying in my entire life, but just because I don't see it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. And the first question that I have is, um, have you ever been bullied? <coughs> And my second question is, what rules can you put into place to prevent or better prevent bullying? Now, I'm not saying that schools don't already have rules to prevent bullying, but I just want to know how you, they can make those rules better. Thank you. <laughs> I, think, um, I think probably an easier question is to ask somebody who um, feel that they have not been bullied because there's probably a fewer number of those hands. Um, I certainly feel like I had some of those experiences growing up. Um, adults are not removed from being bullying either. We see a lot of it online. We see a lot of it on social media. Um, so the example that we're setting for all of you young people is not necessarily the best one. Um, but in terms of what rules um, can be put in place, um, I truly believe that the answer and the solution to bullying stopping on our campus is sitting out here. I totally agree. No amount of um, regulation, rules, or threats, or this or that, are going to stop um, that kind of behavior from happening online um, or in person at school. But I will tell you, I witnessed something very remarkable happen at one of the high schools I was the principal of. And it's this kind of thing that I think will end this kind of behavior on our campuses. It was self-policing of students. And I watched a group of students intervene in a situation where someone was being made fun of and went over to that group of students and said, I didn't do it, students did it, went over and said, we don't do that here. We don't behave that way. And they took that student out of that situation, walked them over to a safe place, and um, continued to support that student through, throughout the year. So if we really want this kind of behavior to stop on campuses, I really, truly believe the answer lies with students. So you can um, step in, you can intervene, you can tell a trusted adult, you can not engage in it yourself. That's a place to start. And, um, and when it comes to social media, listen, I'm going to tell you, it's, um, it's a blessing and a curse for all of us to have all of this access. Um, but you are naive to think that A, it won't happen to you if you have these kind of accounts, and also that if you write something, that it may not affect somebody in a negative way. So anytime you put something down on social media, just know that um, it should be scrutinized and you should be very careful about what you're posting. Um, and I would say students get active and students start intervening because um, no amount of, of regulation or rules or threats of rules are going to stop this from, from happening unless students get involved. Thank you. Next, we're going to move to an a question from the social media table. We would like to open up this question to all the panelists. Uh, how do you plan on addressing the current issues of rapidly <coughs> increasing depression and anxiety in teens at school? Can they cough? I didn't even hear it all. Oh, it's there on the monitor. I can't read that. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to repeat the question? Yes. <laughs> well, p other people can answer first, and then I'll just add on. So we're good. OK. <laughs> well, the federal government is um, reinstituting Title IV, which is um, a good sign, which will be directed solely to um, mental health um, services, which are drastically lacking in our schools, particularly at younger ages. Um, so I'm excited to see that um, those funds return. We're not exactly sure in what form they will come um, or when they will come, but we know they are on the way. Um, our district has recently instituted um, work at the middle schools for the two years in a row now. I've partnered with our police department to present um, a suicide awareness campaign so that um, people are aware of the signs. And um, I, I think that it's, it, is a, it is a growing problem. And um, I, I think there's a lot more that we can and should do in public education to address the concerns. And um, I'm not one of those. Um, Senator Wilk knows. He, he is a, um, a very good friend to Simi Valley. He used to represent our area. 
Um, he no longer does, and we wish to have him back. But um, I, I am not one that says throwing more money at a problem fixes it. So I think that we do have um, resources out there that could be uh, used um, if, if, if some of that was lightened up. Um, Senator Wilk represents um, some diverse school districts. Um, back to the funding um, formula that he was mentioning. Um, in my current district, I would have to say I would advocate for a different funding, funding formula, but if I were the superintendent 15 miles away, I would love the funding formula. Um, so it is um, not deniable that students that come from um, areas that have um, uh, higher um, levels of poverty and um, uh, needs in, in, in language acquisition have more needs. Um, they have more difficult challenges for schools to address. But I think that what has been lost recently in this new formula is that um, districts like Simi Valley, who are a high-performing district, have the same challenge for the other end of the spectrum as well as that end of the spectrum. And we don't want to lose sight of the fact that all kids, whether they um, come from poverty or they come from educated families um, or the other end of the spectrum, have the potential to have um, social emotional needs. And sometimes those stressors on high performing students are equally as strong as students who come from um, maybe less stressful environments in terms of academic rigor. So I think we can't lose sight of that. And in 2019, when the legislator takes this conversation up again, I hope they will um, look at the disparity between districts. I, I won't name one, but 15 miles from here, a district gets $30 million more than Simi Valley Unified School District does. And I'm not saying they're not in need of those funds. Um, but what I'm saying is that districts like Simi Valley and Oak Park and Moore Park and the Conejo Valley and Las Virginis have needs in this area as well. Thank you. Would any other panelists like to add to that? Um, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Um, I recently, in the last few months, they put together a, our, our district has put together a suicide uh, task force and like think tank because we know that those things are going to be coming up. Um, we've had some unfortunate things happen within our district. Um, and so looking at education and identifying some of those students ahead of time, we've looked at other districts and, and what they've done. And we're putting together a plan for further education um, so that we can identify those students earlier. And, and then I'll just quickly add that, that at all three of our community colleges, we have student health centers and we also have behavioral intervention care teams. And those are real critical in us being able to help students that do have issues. And our staff and our faculty are the real connector points that can kind of recognize if there's an issue with students and help get them connected with our um, intervention care teams and ultimately with um, counseling and other resources to help them through um, some issues that they may be happening. But, but it is something that, you know, we're actually seeing more students accessing those services. It's, it's a growing issue and we're doing a lot of professional development on our campuses to make sure our faculty and staff are educated about how to recognize when something seems to be occurring and to know how to get the students the help they need. Thank you. Now we're gonna move on to our next topic on higher education. This first question is directed to Dr. Gillespie. Community college is often stigmatized among many high school students. What are the benefits of attending community college? How can students learn about community college process and whether it's the right fit for them? And what is Ventura County Community College doing to change its perceived stigma? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, thank you for that question. And, and I'd kind of like to um, put a question out to the audience is how many of you have had a family member or know someone who's gone to one of our community colleges? Okay, so that's that's a great number of you have. And, and how many of you are thinking about going to one of our community colleges? Thinking, okay. So, so I find that interesting as well because when I ask that question, what I would like to see is every hand up. Mm -hmm. Because our three community colleges are your community colleges. We have the word community right in our name. And you know, we have a local board of directors, five community members, five citizens who um, contribute their time to actually represent the community 
in how we operate as community colleges. And Trustee Perez, he was introduced earlier, he's um, here today participating. So, so we're very focused on wanting to serve students and serve them well in helping them progress through the higher education process to a career or on to further higher education. And, you know, when you look at the high cost of education today, my question again is, why wouldn't you think about community colleges? Because we now have the opportunity to have community college free for your first year as far as fee-based. I mean, we'll have to figure out around the textbooks and other things. And with our community college foundations that have already had some promised programs, we can now extend that to hopefully even the second year of free fee community college because even if you have to pay at a community college, the fees are about 750 a semester if you're taking 15 credits. That's a fraction of what it costs anywhere else. And you receive high quality education from faculty members who only focus is teaching and you'll also have smaller class sizes and you have the opportunity to you know explore if you're still trying to determine what you want to study or if you know what you want to study we can have a quick pathway through for you the other thing is is community colleges are ready for the honor student somebody who's already had some college level classes ready for college level math move right through we're also ready for students who maybe need some additional help to be college ready in English and math. So no matter where a student is, we're here to help you and meet your need. So, you know, in future years, whether it's a gathering of this one or of this group or other groups, when I ask the question, who's thinking of community college, I'd like to see all the hands raised. And, and, and you know, we can do a better job of, of communicating out. I mean, you're more social media and technologically advanced than we are, and we're now really starting to incorporate and embrace Facebook, Twitter, and other things in the ways we're reaching out to um, potential students now as well as our current students because, you know, email is, isn't the thing to do it. We really want to um, be relevant and reach out to connect with you in ways that are meaningful so that you know about how community colleges could help you on your um, career and educational goals. Thank you. I, next, I just want to add to that. I, co <laughs> I concur with everything the chancellor said. I, I make decisions based upon data. And if you look at the data, students that go to community college first and then to the UC system perform better than students that spend their entire academic career at the UC system. Because when you're at a community college, you're going to know your professor. You're going to be in a classroom, you know, 30, 35. You go to UC, you're going to be 800 students. You're never going to interface with the professor. You're going to get a TA. Uh, you get, I think you're going to get a much better education going to community college first than, than going to UC. Thank you. Uh, so there's many students who... Oh, oh, but one thing. So how many are thinking of community college now? <laughs> now. Every hand. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> so there's many students who choose um, not to go to um, a community college or a public university, um, but choose to go to a private one instead. And they, uh, especially the high prices, many students have found that that impedes their goals. So uh, just a general question to all of the panelists. Do you have any programs to educate students on uh, some of their financial options for attending college? Well, I, so I'll answer that. So a lot of times, you know, people don't even apply to the, the so there's private nonprofit colleges like, you know, Calu, University of Redlands, and then you have private, like proprietary colleges like ITT, you know that. I want to talk about private nonprofit. Um, yeah, they're a lot more expensive, but honestly, depending on what kind of student they're looking for at the time, you may get an incredible package. So like my, my son ended up going to University of Redlands, and with the, with the package they gave him, it was actually a little bit lower than if he had gone to, to UC. So I mean, obviously they get to set their own, own parameters, but depending on what student they're looking at at the time, you may get a nice package. One of the things that the legislature has been trying to, trying to stop, but uh, which I'm not supportive of, is not allowing Cal grants to be used 
at private uh, nonprofit uh, colleges and universities, and I, I think I think that's wrong. We're all taxpayers. You got to be able to use the money wherever you want. So that's been a battle raging the last couple of years, and hopefully we've put that to bed. But it remains to be seen. And and the one thing that you know I'll add is that you know it's hard sometimes when you're you're a student looking at what college and things to go to to want to focus on the the finance part because you want to go. We'll look at the big name or the prestige and so on. But the, the finances are a key thing because you do not want to end up with getting an undergraduate degree but having $100,000 in student loans. I mean, that you know, can set you back financially and make it a real challenge moving forward. So really encourage all of you to um, learn about the different types of financial aid because there are a lot of grants that are out there. You do need to apply for the FAFSA, the federal financial aid form, but there's grants, there's scholarships, and then, you know, lastly, look at loans. But, but I know that's kind of an individual student and family decision, but um, make, making financial, the financial component an important part of your decision is critical just for your long-term um, financial sustainability moving ahead. Thank you. Uh, we now have a question from our audience engagement team. Hi, my name is James. I'm part of the audience engagement team, and I have a question from the audience. Can we gain more assistance for students still figuring out their path for college? And what is the benefit of AP classes in your eyes? Um. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Could you repeat that one? Yeah, he was kind of the first one. Can you repeat okay. the question? Yeah, I didn't quite get Sorry. everything. I got it. Can we gain more assistance for <coughs> students still figuring out their path for college? Don't and worry, yeah. what is the benefit of AP classes in your eyes? Oh, the AP classes? Yes, AP yeah. classes. Um, so the benefit of Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll go to one piece of that. Um, you know, every one of our high schools, um, Apollo and uh, Monta Vista have their, their counselors. It's, it's a little, because they're a little bit of a smaller schools, but every one of your high schools has a college and career um, person in charge of that. That will help you with scholarships, help you, help you try to find your way. And I think, honestly, I, I really feel like they're underutilized. I've spent the last year, I have a junior in high school, I've spent the last year going to college and career nights um, at the local high schools, and they're not super well attended, you guys, you know? If you really want the information, the information is there to be found. I went last night at Simi High. There were kids there from Royal, from Santa Sue, and there were probably 300 people. Well, I know that there's way more than 300 kids graduating from our three local high schools. So I, I really, really encourage you to, to look into the resources that you actually have at your schools. You have some really dynamic people there that really want the best for you, and then you just kind of have to tap into them. All right, let's have some truth talk about AP classes, <laughs> AP and IV, because you're going to get mixed messages about this. I can tell you the, the realities are that colleges and universities accept eight semesters. So that's four AP classes. So anything you do beyond that is good for you. Right? But here's the other part of that. We can tell you that students, they're looking for well-rounded students, so take some AP, do community service, but until the most prestigious universities in this country stop accepting students who took 15 AP classes, that's bad advice. If your goal is to go to Princeton, Harvard, Yale, UCLA, you're going to take a lot of AP classes. And you know, you, we can tell you that they want well-rounded students. But just go look at who they accept. That information is public every single year. So go look who, who they accepted, what kind of coursework did they take. And I would love to tell you all, yes, take four or five AP classes and then focus on arts and do other things. But we may be doing you a disservice if you're trying to get into some of these universities. That's not the case at all institutions. But if you know you have a specific goal of going to one of these most prestigious universities in the world, you need to directly connect with them and ask them the question, well, how many AP classes on average did a student in your a freshman class last year take? And it won't be four. Um, I will just tell you that. Um, now having said that, um, our district um, 
it has done some work that I'm extremely proud of. Um, it's called Equal Opportunity Schools. We talked about access earlier. Um, we had a lot of requirements on AP and IB in our district, and I'm proud of our board for removing all of those prerequisites. And at our high schools now, if a student wants to attempt an AP or an IB course, there is a way for you to do that with support. And that was um, a really big deal. And so this year alone at Simi Valley High School, we have 170 plus students taking an AP class that they would not have otherwise qualified for if the prerequisites were there. Last year at Royal High School, about 140 um, did the same. And at the semester break last year, 95% of those students were being successful in their first ever AP course. So this is really good data. And it's really um, good for students to know that the opportunity is there for you. I believe in public education that we talk a lot about the achievement gap. Um, I really don't believe that there, that, that is um, a, um, a lone issue. It's an opportunity gap. And students who have access, uh, Senator Wilk talked about net neutrality. Sen students who have access to resources at home um, creates an opportunity gap. Those who don't have a gap. So now that we have removed these barriers to getting into these honors, AP and IB courses, we want to see more and more students step up to the challenge. And when you register the following year for classes, which is coming up in March, folks, consider yourself a scholar student. Consider yourself an AP or IB student. We've removed those barriers, and now it's time for you all to put your hand in the air and say you want to try. And um, it will be tough. It's not easy. And the teachers are doing remarkable work um, with students who maybe came into classes um, without the types of skills they're used to students having that are sitting in an <coughs> AP class, but they're working with students. We're providing you summer um, courses to get you ready for the kind of rigor of writing and reading you will need. And we'd like to see more and more students take advantage of that opportunity, because I truly believe that every student in our district has the capacity and the capability of being a top scholar. You may not be able to do it for all six cl classes during your day, but attempt one. And your counselors are skilled at helping you figure out what that class might be that you might have the best chance of being successful in. And so please, please, please consider, um, you know, consider those options when you enroll in courses this, this March. And I, like I said, I'm very proud of the work our district has done to remove those barriers so students can have access to those courses. Uh, so Dr. Poplinski, um, so a lot of students, when they enter high school and uh, for AP classes, they don't have an idea of the rigor, especially you know, middle school courses really aren't mm -hmm. anywhere near the same level as an AP course. So have you found an issue with these barriers removed that students are overloading themselves in courses or really taking courses that um, they that there they might is, not be ready for. Yeah, they might not yeah. be ready for. Yeah, absolutely. And so what we've done with the with um, this initiative is put into place supports for these kids. Um, it's not a hundred percent effective. Um, not every kid is going to pass that AP class. Um, but remember, this is college level work. So um, and this is a really good indicator for students to know that if they can make it through an AP World History class or an AP Calculus class. Um, and that's the kind of expectation that a college or a junior college is going to have on them. Um, it gives you a good indication of it, whether or not you're ready. And that's why Dr. Gillespie's point about you know, community college accepting scholarly students is absolutely true. Um, some of the brightest students we have in our district go off to our community college system before heading off to a four-year school for a lot of different reasons. Um, but having no exposure to this kind of rigor puts you at a disadvantage when you do hit the college, uh, the community college system or the college system. And I know that over the last um, decade, the community college system has had to do a lot of work um, re-preparing students that came to them um, for college-ready classes that may not have had the prerequisite skill. Well, now that's happening in our high schools with these types of classes. So uh, we're committed to this program. We're committed to helping students through this process. And um, the, the high schools are doing some amazing work right now. I will tell you, this came about because um, we, we asked a company to come help us to find out if um, the range of our students were reaching these top AP or IB courses. And what they were looking for are, are young women reaching the number of um, math and science AP courses as their counterpart males. Um, they looked at diversity. They looked at all kinds of things. And what we were really proud of is that one of our high schools didn't need their services. 
They were already getting students to the equal numbers in um, these kind of classes. And what we found at the other two high schools is that within two years' time, we now have 300 plus students that have found their ways into AP courses and they're doing well. And it's credit to the teachers because that was a, in education we talk about moving someone's cheese. You know, you're used to your cheese being here and when someone moves it, it's an adjustment. Um, well, this was a huge adjustment for some teachers because they're used to getting, you know, 100% of students in their AP bio class that came with, you know, X whatever, you know, requisite on their language arts score on the CAPS test, and now they have a whole range. And that changed the way that teachers needed to teach, and in my view, that was a good thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, we now will be taking a rapid fire round of questions. Hey school board, it's Sidra coming at you with a flip grid, and I'm gonna ask, um, how do we help students discover their passions? And by that I mean, what kind of new activities will there be in the future, like clubs and classes, etc.? Thanks for watching. <laughs> hey. Hmm. Well, uh, what I can say is a lot of the clubs on your campuses are are generated by you. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you really think that there should be something on your campus, all you need to do is find a, a, a teacher advisor, right, that will help and support you in any type of club that you would like to put together. So again, I, I hate to say it, but it still goes back, to, uh, back on you. And, and you know, I know there are a lot of student leaders in this room, so I mean, consider it. And, and the other really great thing about starting a club on your campus and, and about something that you're passionate about is when you do turn around and, and you do do college applications or, or decide to be an entrepreneur or, or wherever it is you decide to go, if you're letting your passion lead you there, you know, you already have this game half done. You know, passion, passion in what you're doing will, will breed success. Um, and the other part of the question was, okay, camp, you know, classes. So the, um, the career and technical training classes, I know that for many, many years, there was not an auto shop at Simi High. I mean, it was there, but it really wasn't there. Um, so things like that, those types of classes are coming back. I know people always say, you know, there's no home ec, there's no auto shop, there's no wood shop. You know what, there is. There's a, there's a great cabinet shop at Royal High School. I think sometimes you don't always necessarily know what you have, and, and as these doors open and as we have student interest, those classes can grow. Um, but, you know, we need student interest in things to make, make more interesting, more dynamic classes and clubs at your schools. And, Go ahead. And uh, one thing I'd add to that is to really take advantage of apprenticeships and internships, <coughs> because the legislature actually recognized the value in those, and they've um, provided additional funding to support internships and apprenticeships. And it doesn't mean that you're, you know, if you say you want to apprenticeship because you're interested in automotive technology and hybrid cars, if you do that internship, that doesn't mean that has to be your career, yet at the same time, <coughs> that could be your passion and something that you can get a, a technical degree in automotive technology and you can graduate and, and have a $60,000 a year job. But these apprenticeships and internships can actually start at the high school level and continue on at the community college level and they provide you that opportunity to apply the learning you had to something you think that you may have a passion for. Thank you. Now we're going to show, uh, go to our social media table for more questions. <coughs> so I have a question from Graham Ross and Jonathan Revivo. They're asking, is there a program in place to help transition kids from private schools to public schools? <coughs> That is a really good question. We, um, as, a, as a school district, we, um, when we do registration, we do have a separate private school <coughs> night for students that are transitioning from um, private institutions back to public school. So that does exist. Um, and then um, usually the counselors, um, when they do their registration nights, 
um, you know, they make the materials separate for, for private schools. But um, so we have some services. Um, I'm not sure. I would love to see that number grow. Um, <laughs> that we would need to have a, you know, a parent night for that kind of thing, but um, typically it's dealt with at each individual school. Um, this is the question to all the panelists. Would going to a college such, such as a community college impact the ability to find a job within whatever career um, they're studying for? Uh, um, for that, I would say that going to a community college <laughs> would, would help them towards that goal of um, finding the career that they are, are interested in. Because, you know, we do have a number of certificate and applied associate degrees that are focused on getting a person into that um, career in which they're interested in. There's, I'd mentioned the automotive technology, there's a wide range of health fields from nursing to optical technician. Um, dental hygiene, x-ray technician, and all of those require, you know, two-year degrees. There's a wide range of two-year business degrees, ranging from accounting to entrepreneurship. Um, we have water science. There's a, a, a broad um, range of disciplines that you can explore, get the training that you need, and the skills that are required to get a good job in um, the, the, the high demand, high wage areas that we have in our economy today. And, and again, a number of the classes you'd take, some of the general ed requirements and so on, would be applicable to um, four year degrees should you move on to further higher education. Yeah, I, I just want to add on to that. So community colleges get a bum rap because the state, they just use certain metrics and they say the community college completion rate's not high enough. The fact of the matter is, a lot of those students that go into those career tech programs get the job they want before they graduate. So for me, if you're a student and your job is to, to be uh, a technician you know, at the local Nissan dealership and you get that job, to me that's completion and, and, and that, that should be acknowledged. So we don't have that data. I had a meeting last week with the Public Policy Institute of, of California and I asked them to take, take a look at that specifically for community colleges so they're getting the data from the EDD and they're going to mesh those together and we want to take a, take a look at that because I think the completion rate at community college is much higher than is, is acknowledged by the state. Well, and a lot of kids, you know, I, I know a lot of kids personally that have started like at Moore Park Ventura, which by the way are two of the top 10 schools in the state of California out of the 121. You know, and they're right here in your own backyard. You can live at home, that's savings cost, you know, education's expensive. But a lot of those kids then turn around and go to UCL, UC Davis, UCLA, and go to these big schools that everybody's, oh, I can get my four-year degree from there. Well, you know what? You can get your two-year degree and transfer straight to those schools. Because, you know, it's a great place to start, but you can finish anywhere, you know, and your degree is going to say that. So definitely think of it as an option, as a cost savings, as staying a little bit closer to home, as a way to explore. It, it really... Um, I, I do think they get a bum rap, and it's really, really unfortunate because there's so much knowledge there. Thank you. Next, we're going to answer a question from the audience through student engagement. Hi, my name is Om. I'm with the student engagement team. I have a question for Dr. Popinski. In other countries, and even in some states, music classes are required and considered vital to one's education. Why aren't music classes deemed important in our education? Nice. when there have been studies linking musical, musical training to improvement in cognitive strength and verbal recall proficiency. Yeah, totally agree that the arts um, should have a more prominent place in our daily curriculum. And um, the, the, re the reality is this, and again, it goes back to the pressures of our system on preparing you know, students for these top universities because um, when we earlier talking about graduation requirements, Let's say we added in a, um, a life skills class or a music class. Um, I could ask you, where would that fit in your schedule? Um, it wouldn't. It wouldn't because you're in probably four AP classes, three or four AP classes, this type of thing. So we have a confined set of time. And as we mentioned earlier, the pendulum swings. Um, we swung towards this high number of AP and rigor and all of that. We're, we're gently leaning back towards more well-rounded students. So although it likely will not happen while you were in high school, I would fully expect 
that in the next decade or so we do see some kind of movement back to art education, those kind of things being not only encouraged in schools, but somehow required and included. Um, the, the, the swing in education, it seems to take about 10 to 15 years for an initiative to go through. The good ones stick. And when you're on the ride, when you're on the swing, you just know you're going to go back the other direction at some point. And um, I certainly hope we do go back that direction. Um, those of you who know me personally know that I am a strong proponent of the arts and education. And um, I'm just I'm glad in our district we've been able to maintain what we have uh, we, we currently have. Um, we've been able to avoid a lot of the the severity of cuts in arts. Um, but yeah, totally agree with the question. And um, yeah, when you get to vote. When you start voting, vote for those kind of initiatives. Thank you. Uh, we will now go back to our social media team for a question. Um, we have a controversial question from the audience <laughs> that has raised yes, many lengthy does. debates in the classroom. Does pineapple belong on pizza? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, we thank you all for attending our youth town hall. Um, another round of applause for our amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you guys have any other questions, you guys are always free to um, send them an email. You guys are free to uh, uh, tweet at Sith2018 on your phones, and they will be there to answer your questions. And you can also contact any of us youth council members. We will be more than happy to forward your questions to them as well. Um, just in general, thank you guys for coming out, and we really appreciate your participation and your attendance today. Could we give one last round of applause to our social media?